All right, so welcome back to The Young Idealist and my series on classical German philosophy and German idealism. Today I have a very special guest. I have Dr. Corey W. Dyke um, from the University of Western Ontario um, to discuss uh, the great philosopher Christian Wolff. So Dr. Corey W. Dyke specializes in the history of German philosophy with an emphasis on the 18th century. His most recent research has focused on issues in metaphysics and the philosophy of mind in the period from Leibniz to Kant, in addition to recovering the contributions of women and underrepresented groups to German philosophy in this period. Dr. Dyke has a forthcoming monograph entitled The First 50 Years of German Metaphysics, um, Oxford University Press, and considers developments in German philosophy between roughly 1700 to 1750, focusing on the interpretations and receptions of the impact of Wolff's Deutsche Metaphysica. Um, thank you for being here, uh, Corey. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I actually became accustomed to your scholarship and your work through this wonderful text. Um, I don't know if you can see it because of the light. Yeah, there it is, yeah. But early modern German philosophy, um, selections edited and translated by you. So this was fantastic because um, as a teacher's assistant, I've been working on, I've been TAing early um, early modern philosophy, so Descartes and, and Hume, but I knew literally nothing about the Lange and, and Wolf and many of the other figures that you have in this text, um, yeah. which is brilliant. Um, and also, um, your edited volume with Falk Wunderlich um, on Kant and his contemporaries, which yeah. is a fantastic edition. This, both volumes are wonderful. I really enjoyed this one as well because of the essays. Um, so that's how I, I kind of got to know your philosophy and, and some of your other essays. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, it's great to have you. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to talk about this stuff with you. Um, if I may just make one point on the um, on the first volume that you, you put up there, the uh, early modern German philosophy. So we're going to talk a lot about Wolf today, uh, I understand, but uh, it, it, the, one of the texts you mentioned is by, is by uh, Joachim Lange, who is one of Wolf's uh, kind of most vigorous, I suppose, pietist critics. Um, but in the in the new book that I have coming out, uh, the first fifty years of German metaphysics, I also break a lance for the intellectual integrity and interest of the Pietist tradition, and you get a sense, I think, of long as maybe not sophistication, but um, some uh, the uh, some of the uh, um, the important claims that he makes, the centrality that freedom takes in his in his broader metaphysics, already in that briefly excerpted text there. Um, and of course, the text by Crusius in that volume, I think, is very important. For instance, if you're looking at Kant's uh, new elucidation, uh, Kant is basically uh, responding to Crusius's uh, uh, case in his his essay on the use and uh, use and limits of the principle of sufficient reason. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, as well as speaking about Lange there for a second, mm -hmm. um, I really. I really think that this this edition is fantastic, and I I wish more people would get a hold of this so they could read some of these excerpts, read some of these um, uh, translations. They're they're mm -hmm. wonderful. So just just before we begin, I was just wondering, um, and I know I do this in in all of the interviews that I I have. I was wondering if you could maybe introduce who Christian Wolf is why his philosophy is important in the history of German philosophy and why as scholars and uh, students, we should read um, his work. That's a big question. I know, I'm sorry yeah. to just throw that at you. No, that's fine. Um, so uh, Christian Wolff was, uh, I mean, he was a lot of things. Uh, first and foremost, he was a professor uh, of, of philosophy or in the philosophy faculty uh, in the, the University of Halle uh, and then later at the University of Marburg. Um, but he, in terms of his intellectual interests, they were um, uh, almost impossibly wide ranging. Uh, he was a, a mathematician, uh, he was a scientist, uh, he was a, a philosopher in our sense. Uh, he wrote on moral philosophy, on theoretical philosophy. He invented some new disciplines like empirical psychology, for instance, that wasn't a, a, a specific uh, narrowly defined discipline until Wolf invented it. He also talks about other disciplines like, like anthropology, 
um, uh, a variety, you know, aesthetics or a variety of, of, uh, of topics that he doesn't engage in in a lot of detail, but which are kind of given a kind of a, a place in Volt's broader system. Um, so he was, uh, he was an incredibly influential uh, philosopher in his own time. Um, and I think that uh, in terms of the, the second part of your question, what, what, is, what was his um, uh, importance in the history of German philosophy? Um, I think that he's, 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 it's fair to say he's, he's indispensable to read and understand if you want to appreciate the developments in German philosophy in the 18th century up to and probably including Kant. Um, his, his impact on German philosophy was, was really, before Kant, second to none. Um, he was a, 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 a modernizer. So German philosophy before Wolf um, was mired in this kind of uh, uh, you know, Protestant scholasticism, uh, Protestant and Catholic scholasticism. Uh, it was uh, uh, it, it was quite different than what you know philosophy uh, looked like in in France or England at the time. And so Wolf was responsible really for bringing German philosophy uh, up to date. And he did this by by incorporating a number of influences, Leibniz, of course, most uh, most obviously, uh, into his philosophical thought, but engaging with other kind of you know prototypically modern themes like materialism, and Spinozism, uh, in his views that made them a bit more current, a bit more relevant to the contemporary philosophical context. Another another important contribution on uh, uh, by Wolf is of course his um, um, his modernization of or indeed the foundation of a German philosophical vocabulary. Um, so this is a point that uh, has often been made, but uh, uh, it bears emphasizing that Wolf's his his he, what he did was basically uh, uh, provide us with uh, a, a German philosophical vocabulary. So um, there had been some moves to publish in German and to lecture in German before Wolf. His his colleague uh, Tomasius Christian Tomasius of Halle uh, had already started lecturing in German and publishing some kind of um, popular philosophical texts in the language, um, but Wolf uh, made it a priority to publish in German. Uh, so we find this in his in his text on logic, published in 1713. But most importantly, I think, and most dramatically, uh, most impactfully, in his German Metaphysics uh, of 17 1720. Uh, in that text, if you if you have a copy, you can go to the very back of it, and you'll see that there's two registers. And the first register gives you a list of Latin terms and his German rendering of those Latin terms. And so for me, that 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 first register has often been something of a Rosetta Stone uh, for looking at German philosophy in the in you know in the 18th century. That we can you know Wolf doesn't always opt for natural or uh, you know the most obvious renderings of these terms. Um, but his his choices impact uh, German philosophy afterwards. And I should say that on this issue of language too, um, one of Wolf's less appreciated, uh, um, uh, one of the, the less appreciated consequences of Wolf's decision to write in German uh, is of course that he made the, uh, uh, he made philosophical um, uh, thinking, uh, he made, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, debates and discussions on technical philosophical themes accessible to a new audience, right, who weren't necessarily educated in, in Latin, uh, but had, that he published it in the vernacular, meant that this, his views got that much uh, wider uh, um, uh, attention. Uh, and this was vital, of course, for inspiring folks who didn't have a kind of advanced university education, but also, for instance, women uh, who didn't have uh, any access to, to Latin. Uh, they didn't have the same avenues of formal education as, as, as men did. Uh, and so Wolf's philosophy ended up becoming very popular uh, for women, uh, for literate women. Uh, and uh, th at one point, someone comments on this kind of veritable lycanthropy that's broken out because uh, all of these women are reading Wolf. Um, so that was a, a, less, a, a less well appreciated, but a nonetheless a very important impact of Wolf's decision to write in German. Um, so yeah, Wolf, Wolf then, he, he, his importance for the time is, is primarily, I think, in terms of this, this modernizing impact he had on German ideas. Um, and uh, uh, and I mean, his views were were widely read. Uh, his uh, he had a lot of students that he placed in university positions, and that helped kind of establish Wolfianism as not just a philosophical but a kind of a academic movement as well. Um, they quickly occupied uh, chairs in philosophy all around uh, Germany, um, and uh, that just helped to spread his influence. So. And there's a couple of other points that might mention in terms of his impact. Of course, the controversy he had with the Pietists served to uh, draw all sorts of attention to him as a martyr for the Enlightenment, and so it got him 
you know, uh, attention by, by leading French intellectuals, um, got in invitations to all sorts of learned academies and so forth. Um, but uh, yeah, so that was another another aspect of, of Wolf's importance for the period. Um, in terms of his importance for us, um, I think uh, for those of us who, I, I mean, I presume the audience of this, of, of this, um, of this show is, are, are, are interested in kind of classical German philosophy. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, from what I've said before, uh, Wolf's importance for understanding Kant, for instance, is, 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 uh, uh, is fairly obvious. Um, while Kant, of course, is a revolutionary thinker and changing things in a lot of ways, the primary foil or one of the primary foils for him is, is, is Wolfian, is Leibnizian Wolfian philosophy and, and Wolf's metaphysics in particular. Um, but I think that um, as more scholarship is being done on, on Wolf um, and uh, thinkers are approaching his 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 texts with a bit more charity in mind and not not kind of eagerly dismissing him as a dogmatic Leibnizian or something. We're finding that that Wolf also has uh, um, you know, there's a richness there in his thinking that there's there's a complexity that we didn't we, that maybe was recognized before and that Wolf is I think as a result um, increasingly uh, found to be worth studying in his own right and not just as a kind of avenue to understanding Kant a little bit better. So, so yeah, I think that uh, for historians of German philosophy, both is, uh, is, 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 is uh, fairly essential uh, for understanding the broader developments in the period, but also uh, by way of acquainting ourselves with a, with a complex and impactful thing. Um, I was surprised that um, in his ethics, he, he brings up Confucius. I was surprised yeah. that he has, he had quite a, an interest in Chinese philosophy and that kind of sparked a little bit of, um, tension with the pietists in Hala. I was wondering, um, normally what, what I go through on this show is uh, we discuss who the philosopher was and then give a little biography. I was wondering if we could maybe perhaps give a brief biography of, of his life and maybe maybe some of the major events that went out through uh, his philosophical career. Yeah, so unlike Kant, uh, Wolf had a, a fairly eventful life. Um, <laughs> uh, many of the events are kind of in the, I suppose, the first half or so. But uh, yeah, so he was born in 1679 in a town uh, now called Breslau. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, it was called Breslau at the time. Uh, it's uh, in, in, in contemporary Poland. I don't know how it's pronounced uh, in the Polish. Um, but it was actually a German, a kind of a culturally German region of Poland uh, called Silesia um, with its own kind of distinct literary uh, tradition. Uh, Wolf went to gymnasium, the Maria Magdalena gymnasium uh, in uh, Breslau. Uh, and um, his teacher, what, he had a couple of very influential teachers. One was Christian Gryphius, who was the son of a very important Silesian poet and playwright, Andreas Gryphius. Um, but his, his teachers there uh, sparked an interest in him in philosophy. Um, he apparently distinguished himself by his ability to debate the uh, students in the nearby Catholic uh, gymnasium, uh, uh, you know, uh, going on, you know, chapter and verse on them and uh, uh, winning the, the the disputations that they would have regularly. So Wolf had a kind of interest in philosophy early on, at least in disputation, but he actually became very interested in mathematics. Uh, and he went to Jena to study uh, mathematics there. They had a very influential uh, a couple of mathematicians on the faculty there. Uh, and uh, Wolf went there in 1699. And stayed there until 1702, at which point he went to Leipzig, uh, where he studied at the university there, uh, and he uh, uh, defended his habilitation in 1703. And this is a text you mentioned, the, the later uh, rectoral address on the practical philosophy of the Chinese. The habilitation thesis was on uh, practical philosophy. It was on a kind of application of, of the mathematical method to matters relating to, to ethics, uh, to the, you know, the, the, the management of the passions and things like this. Um, and this is, uh, so this is, this is important because it's an issue that Wolf would return to, uh, that is to say, this, this kind of, uh, this, this sort of approach to practical philosophy. Um, but it's important, too, because one of the examiners for his habilitation was Otto Menke, who was the chair in moral philosophy at, at Leipzig. And he was also the founder and editor of the Acta Eruditorum, which was the most important, at least, you know, German-based uh, um, uh, intellectual academic journal. Um, uh, and um, uh, Menke uh, wanted Wolf to write reviews uh, for, for the journal. Uh, but in, importantly as well, Menke put Wolf in touch with Leibniz. He was the first person to, to do that. Wolf, as far as we can tell from what he's written before this point, um, hadn't read anything by Leibniz. Uh, 
um, or, or very little. Um, and, and Menke told Wolf that he was going to send his dissertation to Leibniz, his habilitation to Leibniz, and uh, Wolf wrote a kind of a brief accompanying letter. Leibniz was impressed by it, um, uh, and uh, this started a correspondence between the two that lasted until Leibniz's death in 1716. Um, so that's um, that's the very early stuff. Um, but then in 1706, uh, um, the Swedish army occupies Saxony and uh, empties all of the classrooms at the University of Leipzig, where Wolf was was teaching, albeit not in a permanent position. And this uh, this leads him and a number of academics to leave to leave the city. Um, and so Wolf hunts around for um, uh, for a university chair. He gets an offer at a un the University of Gießen, just north of Frankfurt am Main, and uh, he accepts the position and he's going to make his way there. Um, but circumstances happened. Uh, Wolf was uh, uh, on his way and he stopped in Halle, on the, on the on the way to this position uh, where they had a new university that had been founded uh, with an explicitly kind of modern mandate. Um, and uh, and Wolf was quite taken with it. He was attracted by the fact that uh, they, they needed a mathematician and that this would be a position that was primarily in, in, in mathematics. And so uh, Wolf actually ended up turning, so uh, uh, declining the position in Gießen and taking up the position in Halle. And he started there in January of 1707. And this uh, was, uh, Wolf was quite happy in Halle. Uh, he uh, did plenty of work first in mathematics and, and uh, natural science primarily, um, but increasingly became interested in, in you know, philosophical issues and philosophical, uh, theoretical philosophy. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in, in addition to you know things like scientific method and so forth, and he increasingly taught, lectured, and uh, and published on on philosophical uh, issues, uh, and this uh, culminated, I suppose, uh, with the, um, the 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 series of texts in German that begin with a vernünftige Gedanken, so rational thoughts on, and then you know one on logic, one on metaphysics, one on ethics, one on politics, one on theology, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, so the, the the text on metaphysics in particular was published in 1720. Um, it was actually published late in 1719, but it has a date on the on the cover that says 1720. In any case, um, Wolf's kind of increasing interest in metaphysical issues, um, including issues in natural theology, um, brought him to to the attention of his of his colleagues in the faculty of theology at Halle, um, in particular people like August Hermann Franke. Uh, who was the the founder of the uh, the uh, the orphanage in Halle, the very famous orphanage, uh, and Joachim we've already mentioned, um, and uh, they took exception to kind of um, increasing boldness in treating themes relating to to God, the proofs for his existence, um, the uh, the rationality of uh, of certain claims uh, relating to God's nature and uh, and order. Um, and uh, Wolf even, in some cases, offers kind of helpful comments about how to interpret scripture, right? So there's a chapter in the German logic uh, on this. And so um, uh, so you, you mentioned the, the rectoral address, which Wolf delivers in 1723 on the practical philosophy of the Chinese. But Wolf had long been on the radar of his uh, theological colleagues. And so this is the, the 1723 rectoral addresses when the hostilities kind of break out into the open. Right. Um, and uh, at the heart of that issue, I mean, at, at the heart of the conflict um, is a kind of question about jurisdiction. Right. So Wolf does this rectal address saying that um, uh, the uh, that uh, Confucian ethics is consistent. This way, it's possible to have uh, 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 an ethics like the Confucian one that has no it is not informed in any way by Christian revelation, by Christian doctrine, but nonetheless produces virtuous people. Right, and so this was taken as a as an affront to the the, um, the claims on the part of the folks in the theology faculty who thought that revelation was was more or less essential uh, for for uh, having a virtuous character. Um, and um, uh, and so what what Franca did is demanded to see a copy of the rectoral address, and uh, Wolf was pretty convinced that if he gave it to him, all he would do was was use it against him. Uh, and uh, and so Wolf refused. And then there was a question about, I mean, this is the, the original conflict of the faculties um, because the question is who has priority over these matters? Is it the theology faculty or is it the philosophy faculty? And so that's where that dispute started. Um, I mean, with of course the background of the increasing hostilities between the two uh, in terms of uh, treat, Wolf's treatment of natural theology and his kind of incursions into theology. 
Um, but uh, but it was this kind of political issue that forced it into the open. And so this began, began a campaign on the part of the pietists um, to have Wolf's teaching curtailed so that he would no longer be, you know, be able to teach on matters that relate to natural theology. Um, and uh, so the, the the story, there's a, there's a long story here, but the, the shorter version goes something like the, as follows. Um, they approached the king uh, of Prussia, uh, Frederick Wilhelm I, and they said, we want this to happen. Um, this set off a kind of protracted negotiation and a case between them um, uh, with defenses on both sides. But at some point, somebody communicated to, uh, to the king um, that Wolf, in addition to being kind of a, a controversialist, um, also thinks that the pre-established harmony is true, which means that if your troops desert you on the field, they can't be punished because their actions determined in advance. Right. And so uh, the king, who was the soldier king, he was known for his kind of uh, um, preference for and proficiency in battle, uh, wasn't an intellectual at all. But this was kind of the one way in which someone could prevail upon him to, to, to really come down hard on Wolf. And it worked because what the king did is he, he basically wrote an order that said upon receiving this order, Christian Wolf, you're exiled from Prussia uh, on pain of hanging if you don't leave within 48 hours. So. Uh, this order was received in uh, in Halle uh, a day or two later. Wolf received it just as he was getting ready to go to a lecture on natural science, to, to deliver a lecture on natural science, sometime in the late afternoon. Uh, and uh, he basically packed all of his things and, and left Prussia. Now, it sounds like more than it is, right? You have to leave Prussia. Well, that's a pretty large domain. But in fact, all Wolf had to do was just cross the river in Halle into the territory of electoral Saxony. So he didn't have to go very far, but of course it was quite upsetting to him. You know, he's losing his livelihood. Um, his wife was heavily pregnant at the time. It was terribly inconvenient, um, but he crossed the river and then sent his servant back to tell his students why he wasn't there. Uh, and then eventually he ended up taking a position somewhere else, um, namely at the University of Marburg. Um, uh, but the, the battle between Wolf and the Pietists, as far as like an uh, exchange of treatises go, uh, would continue uh, well into the 1730s, right? So uh, the Pietists seemingly never tired of, you know, of reframing their original concerns about Wolf's philosophy, um, casting it as, you know, various sorts of Spinozism or materialism or atheism, and Wolf seemingly never tired of responding to these as well. Um, so anyway, that's that that's uh, uh, that continues until the death of Frederick Wilhelm I and the ascension of Frederick the Great, Frederick II. Uh, in 1740, he made it a priority uh, because of his early interest in Wolf's philosophy. Uh, he made it a priority to to um, uh, retrieve Wolf to a position in Halle, uh, which he did in 1741. Wolf returned and uh, took up a position as, I think, vice chancellor, but also as professor. Um, and at that point, Wolf had published all of the German writings that we know. He published, uh, you know, a, a, another kind of systematic treatment of his philosophy in Latin uh, that brought it to the attention of a wider European audience. Um, and when he got back to Halle, he uh, basically turned his thinking to, to moral philosophy, to practical philosophy, uh, political philosophy, right, natural law theory and stuff like this. And that, that was, th those were the, the, the bulk of his publications until his death in 1754 in Halle. Well, thank you very much for that very rich, um, you know, navigation through his life. That was fa fascinating actually. I was wondering, as you were talking, um, what were Wolf's philosophical influences? Now, I, yeah. I just just before um, you maybe answer that question, I, I've been reading um, the spring publication of the ontology book. I don't know if you've seen this before. Uh, um, I, I've, I've seen it in draft form, but not uh, not the actual physical version yet. So I, I was reading Klaus Ottman's um, introduction and he he had he had mentioned Suarez um yeah. which was kind of piqued my interest so I was just interested in wondering who um Wolf's um philosophical influences were uh, of course yeah. Leibniz is one of them as well too yeah uh we'll start with Leibniz but just to, just on that point about the ontology um so when Wolf sets to rewrite basically or to to re um uh, uh, to represent his philosophical views in the Latin texts. Um, he's, he's more or less explicitly modeling his presentation on a number of scholastic thinkers. And part of it, I think, is because of the um, abiding interest in Wolf among um, 
you know, among uh, like Jesuit academies, for instance, they, they found Wolf to be kind of appropriately systematic, but also someone who effectively addressed the kind of modern threats to theism, like materialism, for instance, right? But you don't find that in some of the scholastic writers. Um, so there's a sense in which Wolf um, goes back to those scholastic sources for his for his subsequent Latin presentation. Um, but I don't know that they're a, a huge influence on the formation of his metaphysics at the outset. I mean, so we mentioned the, the gymnasium, the disputations there. Uh, Wolf clearly had a kind of mastery of, you know, some some at some level of, uh, of scholastic thinking. But it doesn't seem to have uh, 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 had an influence on his early views on metaphysics, as far as I can tell. So there, I think Leibniz is certainly the most obvious uh, influence and arguably the most important. I have some things to say about that. Um, uh, so Leibniz, uh, in the in in, uh, in the correspondence with Wolf, there's um, uh, the, the the topic that they focus on mostly are mathematical issues. Uh, this is something that Leibniz would later would later kind of uh, cite in a letter that was uh, or in a, a discussion that was published. Um, uh, Subsequently, uh, that uh, that he never really talked about philosophical issues with Wolf uh, in their correspondence. So that that seems to go too far. There are some discussions of things like perfection, and early on, some discussions relating to the pre-established harmony. Um, but uh, but yeah, so part of the part of the um, um, the issue in trying to understand the extent of Leibniz's influence on Wolf is that well, Wolf didn't seem to get a lot of it from Leibniz. Uh, directly through their correspondence. In addition, right, Leibniz, uh, his publications, such as they were, were, um, you know, they they were uh, few and far between on philosophical matters. Uh, though Wolf certainly thought highly of, for instance, uh, uh, Leibniz's early essay, "The Meditations on Ideas and Truth," I think, and "Cognition," I think, is how it's translated. That essay from 1684 that was very influential for him in his logic. Um, in addition, Leibniz's uh, um, uh, essay on the emendation of ontology. Uh, was also, I think, 1694. Uh, I'm sorry, the emendation of substance. Um, that was also an important essay that Wolf uh, frequently cites. And then after Leibniz drew, brought it to his attention, his uh, essay on the uh, uh, new system and the exchange with Bale was something that Wolf, Wolf uh, also mentions occasionally. Um, but yeah, there's I think there's limits to that because I mean, I mean and you know, we can talk about this for a long time, but primarily it's because by the time, as I already made clear in the, in the biography I gave that um, by the time Wolf meets Leibniz, he already has a kind of philosophical program underway, right? And so there's no question that Leibniz influences Wolf on certain certain points of of of, uh, of, of doctrine of metaphysical, you know, his metaphysical views. But in terms of the gra the grander scheme that they fit into, uh, Wolf already has a kind of philosophical project up and running that um, that is quite distinct from Leibniz. Uh, and the primary influence on this, on this kind of early philosophical and methodological project, is is a, a fellow who's not often read, um, but who's quite important, and his name is Ehrenfried Walter von Schirnhaus. So you might have heard of Schirnhaus before. He was uh, uh, a Saxon nobleman. Uh, he was also one of the co-discoverers of the secret for making porcelain, uh, which brought the electoral Saxon regime a lot of money in the end. Um, but he was also an intimate of Spinoza's. Uh, with whom Spinoza shared, for instance, a draft of the ethics and corresponded with a fair bit. Um, but he was he wrote his book, uh, The Medicina Mentis, which Wolf uh, read and was transfixed by and basically adopted it as his view on on the proper method of philosophy. Right. So his his notion of the mathematical method draws directly on Schirnhaus. And so what Wolf was interested in doing by the time he meets Leibniz was, first of all, trying to figure out some of the, the, the stuff that Tiernhaus doesn't say much about relating to the mathematical method. So trying to plug some of the gaps in it, but also once he's done that, extending the mathematical method to various areas of philosophy, including metaphysics. And so what Leibniz contributes to that is, well, he you know, helps Wolf develop some of his views on metaphysics, primarily regarding the harmony, um, but, uh, um, and also on the nature of substance. Um, but that's just kind of tweaks to a system that Wolf already more or less, uh, a, a vision that Wolf more or less had in place. Now, I should say that in addition to Tiernhaus, whose influence on Wolf isn't well appreciated, um, uh, there's also in this early period, a very important influence uh, exercised on Wolf by British philosophy. Uh, and um, so returning to, again, a item I mentioned in the biography, this fellow Otto Menke, the uh, editor and founder of the Acta Eruditorum, uh, he brought Wolf on as a reviewer precisely because he needed somebody who could 
follow the debates in England, um, primarily relating to, and, and Scotland, um, but primarily relating to the Newtonian philosophy. Because um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on over there, a lot of really interesting stuff, but nobody had English such that they were able to follow the debates. Because a lot of these texts were written in English, some were in Latin too, but mostly in English. Wolf didn't actually know English, but he con he, he uh, <laughs> convinced Manka that he could learn it quickly. And he did. He taught himself English over the course of the summer, I think, of 1705. Um, and then he, at that point, started actively reviewing uh, the texts uh, relating to the Newtonian philosophy and a variety of other texts that were published in England. And these had a very important influence on Wolf. Um, some, you know, so he, for instance, one of the first texts he reviews was Newton's uh, 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 Newton's Optics, the English edition. Uh, and uh, he has some, he, he, he seems to find it quite sympathetic in terms of its account of method. Um, he uh, also reviews texts by, um, by Clark, by, by Samuel Clark, texts in theology that he also has approving things to talk uh, to say about. Uh, he also looks at uh, a text by Anthony Collins, um, uh, and uh, he claims it later as an inspiration for why he sought to offer a refutation of materialism in his psychology. So there's there's positive and negative influences on both by British philosophy. The point is that they're they're in the mix as well, um, and certainly uh, a, a lot of kind of Wolf's intellectual labor in the um, uh, early 1700s is devoted to to tracking, responding, uh, understanding uh, developments in British philosophy at the time, right? In connection with the priority dispute with with Newton, but also more broadly, just because he knew it was a a really kind of rich forum for for philosophy and scientific thinking. This, see, this is why I I wanted you to come on here and and to discuss Wolf with us, uh, because you know, as someone that's been reading Schelling for a long time, he's been seen as just this you know stepping yeah. stone to Hegel, and Wolf is this has been you know depicted as this kind of Leibnizian, you know, just 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 a Leibnizian philosopher, and I think he that name Leibnizian Wolfianism was named by one of his students. I, I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Um, it's hard to trace who, who, who in fact coined that, but uh, it was thought to be, have been one of his students. Wolf thinks it was, but it's not clear whether the student in this case, Bill Finger was the person who, who actually did coin it. But yeah, he never, he never accepted it. He, uh, he said that at one point he said, I think it's quite true. He says where, uh, where my philosophy ends is where Leibniz's philosophy begins. Right. And so he thought he was doing something continuous with, but nonetheless distinct from uh, what, what Leibniz had done. Awesome. Um, where does one begin with um, Wolf's philosophy if one were to attempt to read um, his ideas? Where, where do you yeah. think one should begin to start reading Wolf's philosophy? I know that's a very vague uh, and broad question as well, too. Yeah, well, it is, it is broad because I mean, it depends on what your interest is, I suppose, in Wolf. Um, so if you're looking at his moral philosophy, for instance, you'll you'll probably start somewhere else um, and you're probably not interested in it in its own right. You're probably interested in it, what, you know, what he has to say about imperatives or uh, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, but uh, assuming that we're talking about his theoretical philosophy, um, there's really two ways in. Uh, one is the uh, is the uh, so-called preliminary discourse, um, which is the uh, treatise, the kind of introductory treatise, programmatic treatise that Wolf publishes at the beginning of his representation of his philosophy in the Latin works. And it's a very useful text. It has some views about the nature of cognition in it, for instance, um, but really just offers a kind of synoptic overview of you know, the domain of philosophy as far as Wolf sees it and offers some very helpful kind of characterizations of his um, of his specific systems, right? Of his, I mean, his, the specific disciplines of philosophy, how they relate to each other uh, in particular. Um, so that's quite helpful. In addition to offering some reflections about the method of philosophy in general. Um, so that's one one way into the Latin works um, that's been translated into English. Uh, I think like from the 70s or something, there's an old translation of this into English that's published with uh, uh, Bob Merrill or something like that. Um, but the other way in, um, probably, uh, uh, maybe more appealing for most, um, would be looking at uh, the, the Wolf's text on metaphysics, uh, for the German text. So this also exists in a number of translations uh, into English. So uh, Eric Watkins translated some of it um, in uh, his uh, background source materials volume. Uh, and I translate some of it as well in that uh, volume you held up before. Um, 
So yeah, this text, which is just kind of colloquially referred to as the German metaphysics, um, I think is a, uh, it's, it's a wonderful introduction to Wolf's views on metaphysics. Um, it gives you a kind of overview of his thinking about it. I mean, and if you look at it carefully, right, because Wolf published uh, 12 different editions of this text in the course of his lifetime, uh, with a number of them differing substantially from the previous ones. But you, if you look at it carefully enough, you can get a sense, too, of how Wolf's kind of philosophy develops, uh, how his thinking develops on a number of themes that were particularly problematic or controversial in his time. Right. This is, these are the way he's responding to these individuals is by amending and expanding his text. Um, but one thing that, I mean, I, I, this is maybe relating to some comments I've already made, um, is that one has to be a bit cautious, too, in looking at the German metaphysics, at least if you're interested in kind of Wolf's own, you know, drawing Wolf's own thinking out of it and not looking at how this might be important for Kant or somebody later on, um, is that the German metaphysics is, you know, it's, it, it's not kind of, uh, it, it shouldn't be read in a vacuum. Uh, it's it it is the the culmination of decades, a couple of decades of thinking about method, about the you know, method of philosophy, the method of science, um, about issues in psychology and natural theology, which both had a kind of an abiding interest in. Um, and so, even though it's typically the first text that we'll that we'll look at when we look at Wolf. Um, there's it's it's drawing a lot in his earlier thinking about these things, and it doesn't always appear on the page. Um, and so there's there's uh, uh, it's important not to treat it like the critique of pure reason, right? Where it's a kind of reversal or because something completely new compared with what happened before, right? Wolf had been kind of systematically, which is quite characteristically for him, but systematically kind of working this out over the past couple of decades. And so there's a, an important continuity with his previous work that you don't necessarily find in Kant. Did he I mean, um, did he focus a lot on uh, forming a new method of how to approach yeah. uh, philosophy? Uh, you know, one of the kind of revolutionary aspects that Descartes has, sorry to bring Descartes up, is that um, moving away from scholastic philosophy, he decided, you know, from the regula on, he needed to create a new method of, of how one could approach philosophy and certainty. I was wondering if Wolf had uh, an approach to methodology and certainty in this sense. Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, whether it's Cartesian is a different question, but um, but certainly he was preoccupied with the question of method, right? I mean, for him that was everything. Um, that we need to we need to fix, right? We need to to set the appropriate method first, and then we can we can apply that in all the areas of human knowledge, right? And so uh, the method that he formulated is called the mathematical method, right? Uh, Mathematical, not because it's it was applied in mathematics, but clearly it draws on a kind of Euclidean geometry, right? The method of Euclidean geometry, um, in terms of having definitions and axioms and principles. Um, but this is augmented through Chirnhaus's uh, Cartesian presentation of of methodology in his in, in his Medicina Mentis, his his primary book. What Wolf does that's a bit different, I think, is is really quite important as far as questions about Wolf's Leibnizianism and rationalism is concerned. Um, is that, uh, for instance, one of those innovations is to allow that certain first principles of demonstrations uh, can express or be drawn from experiences, right? Certain kinds of experiences. Um, and this is this is key for understanding how Wolf's psychology, for instance, works in accordance with this method and how it draws on experience productively in terms of drawing inferences about the nature uh, uh, and essence of the soul. Um, but yeah, so for Wolfen, it's a mathematical method, but the, it, it would be wrong to just kind of, you know, uh, identify that with a kind of, um, you know, lockstep, you know, rationalistic kind of methodology, right, that, that draws solely on Euclid or something like that. Um, there's, uh, a, 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 this, this method is informed by, um, you know, by empiricist thinking, as I mentioned already, with Newton, for instance, scientific thinking, scientific method. Um, that Newton employed of hypotheses, which Wolf also makes use of in the context of his method, um, and uh, is much more than just this kind of rigid syllogistics, as people like Hegel, for instance, will try and caricature Wolf. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, he was. I, I, it's fair to say that he was preoccupied with considerations of method. Um, Wolf is one of the uh, first philosophers to bring up the term ontology. So what what would um, Wolf's ontology be, and how how would it how does he understand it, and how would it differ from our own understanding today in contemporary philosophy of of what ontology is? Yeah. Um, so if you look at the the you know the the other text that you had there, the ontologia, the translation of the ontologia, if you look at that, 
and you look at someone like Suarez, right, or you know, or you know, Thomas or whomever, uh, you're it, the the differences between what Wolf is doing and what they are doing are not going to be immediately clear, right? Um, and so it's uh, you know, I, there is a lot of um, difference between the two. But because Wolf is, I think, trying to hew closely to their form um, and to try and do something that's fairly continuous with what they did, but recapit, you know, but but also addressing the errors that he diagnoses in, in their in their systems, um, it's just not going to be obvious as to what those differences are. They don't they don't uh, they're not worn on the page as it were. Um, but uh, looking at Wolf's early treatments of ontology, especially um, in the lead up to the German metaphysics. Uh, where the ontology is the first chapter, basically. I mean, there's a brief chapter on uh, 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 on some self-certainty, but uh, the second um, most uh, uh, um, uh, ambitious chapter, I suppose, is, is going to be on the ontology. Um, but when you look at, at this uh, text in the context of Wolf's early works, um, a different question comes up, right? So we think of Wolf as maybe primarily an ontologist, certainly a metaphysician, but Wolf, uh, in fact, had a kind of early hostility towards ontology specifically, uh, and doesn't even think it's it's deserving of being a part of philosophy, right? So if you look at, for instance, the German logic, if you look at the the first edition of that text when Wolf gives a kind of breakdown of the topics of of, of philosophy, ontology is not is not part of it, right? A number of other disciplines of metaphysics are, but ontology is left out. And another text that Wolf writes in this period, an account of his lecture activity. Uh, in 1718, he says that in his courses, he does ontology, but kind of as an appendix, he doesn't do it at the beginning of the lectures, right? So he he only talks about it as he needs to have done. So in fact, Wolf, a question comes up then in Wolf's early treatments, which is why does ontology acquire the importance for him that it does? Why does it acquire this priority? Why does he think at the time of the German metaphysics of 1720, that not only do I have to talk about ontology, but it has to be one of the first things I actually treat. Um, and so that's a question that actually hasn't been asked in Wolf scholarship before, because there hasn't been that much attention paid to Wolf's developing thinking on this. Um, but part so at, starting at you know uh, at the beginning of that story, right? Wolf is quite taken with Leibniz's product, a, a project of emending the notion of substance. Um, so providing a notion of substance that avoids this kind of scholastic subtleties and um, you know this uh, this this vagueness or something, but that you know uh, for Leibniz the the new conception of substance is going to have something essentially to do with force. Um, Wolf takes that and tries to expand it to to ontology as a whole and says we need to not just emend this notion, but we have to offer an amended ontology. And for him, what that means is is paring ontology down to the essentials. Um, Right. And for him, what, what, what makes something essential to be treated in ontology is that it's a concept or a principle that's used in a number of other scientific disciplines, right? Science in the broad sense. So it could be a principle like substance that's used in psychology and theology, uh, or it could be, a, you know, a principle like force that's used in physics and, and, uh, and other, uh, other disciplines. Um, and so Wolf wants to kind of pare it down to you know, just what we need to get by so that the, the business of science and the other disciplines can keep going. Um, so at some point, though, Wolf becomes convinced that we need to do more with our ontology, that ontology actually can play a more important role than this. Uh, and in my view, uh, this is something I defend in the forthcoming book, what's essential for Wolf recognizing the importance, the, 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 the importance of ontology in fulfilling this task uh, is actually the, the, the Leibniz-Clark correspondence, which is uh, published in 1717. Um, Wolf himself reviews it in Acta uh, Eriditorum, uh, and he later uh, writes a preface to the German translation published in 1720. So it's right around this time that Wolf is working on the German metaphysics that this correspondence is published. Uh, and Wolf, I think that uh, the, Wolf is inspired by this correspondence, in particular by the by by the Clark's what he views as Clark's errors uh, to expand his ontology. Um, and uh, part of the reason, I think most of the reason why he wants to do this is because he thinks that what Clark is doing is nothing less than, than formulating a kind of Newtonian metaphysics. So there's something that, that Wolf was already suspicious of after the second edition of Wolf's, uh, sorry, of Newton's Principia. Um, but what he sees in Clark is a kind of uh, a full-fledged attempt to offer a metaphysics that's grounded on, on Newtonian principles. And so for Wolf, he thinks that this is, this is it's silly when uh, when geometers start to practice metaphysics, um, despite his own kind of background as, as, as being just that, 
Um, but he uh, he thinks that there's there's uh, um, that the errors that Clark ends up defending in the correspondence with Leibniz stem precisely from his failure to engage in a proper ontology. And so it's in light of that correspondence and in with the ambition of rectifying the errors and the ambitions of a Newtonian metaphysics that Wolf all of a sudden takes his on takes this treatment of ontology he'd neglected for so long and starts to 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 fill it up with defenses of, for instance, the principle of sufficient reason, right, which he hadn't done before. He now has two proofs of it. And that's, of course, a principle that was very contentious in the correspondence itself. But he also has his views on space and time that he adds there, right, in addition to, you know, continuity and motion and things like this. But these are all concepts, the, the definition of which, uh, uh, it, the reality of which is all debated in the correspondence, right, that has a central, it's, it's a central part of the controversy. Um, and it's precisely in response to this and the misuse uh, uh, um, that uh, that the Newtonians want to engage in of these kind of philosophical concepts and principles that Wolf now puts ontology at the beginning of his metaphysics. So then, in the end, to come back to your, your original question, which is what does ontology mean for Wolf? Well, it's I mean, it's in in the early days, it's not something that's a standalone discipline, but a kind of investigation that we kind of um, uh, um, you know grudgingly have to engage in in order to avoid falling prey to the errors of a, of a, of a certain kind of metaphysics, right? Um, and so I, whether that's what we find in the Ontologia of 1730 is a different question because Wolf's aims there are different, his thought has matured in certain ways, but certainly in 1720 at the time of the German metaphysics, this is, this is the kind of background, the context for his, his treatment of ontology there. Well, thank you for that, that, that answer. Um, my next question for you is, what is Wolf's relation to Kant um, and Kant's critical project? Because, yeah. well, at least for me, when you read the Critique of Pure Reason, it seems like Kant's main enemy, or chief enemy, I would say, yeah. is ra the rational dogmatist. Or yeah. And Wolf seems to come across, in Kant's view, as like the dogmatist, capital D. Um, yeah. Do you think that's a fair assessment of, of Wolf? Um, and sorry, I, that that's my question, but it's a it's a little big question, actually, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, whether it's a fair assessment of Wolf, I don't think so. I mean, I, I but I, I I mean, I don't think that Kant presents himself as a careful reader of Wolf or as a kind of, I mean, so by the time we get to you know Kant's early philosophical texts, right, like the New Elucidation, for instance, where he's very much influenced by Wolf in a positive way, he actually defends. You know what, what amounts to like a Wolfian compatibilist view on freedom there, against Crusius's libertarianism. Um, but uh, um, I, yeah, so I, I mean, by the time Kant writes the New Elucidation, or by the time we get to the 1750s, right, Leibnizian Wolfianism means something different, right? It's not just the views of Wolf, but it's you know it's the views of Wolf augmented by you know. Um, all of his disciples, some of whom are doing things that Wolf himself right, re rejected. Right? So you have someone like Knudsen, for instance, one of Kant's teachers, um, who's defending physical influx, right? um, rather than you know, opting for uh, the, the, the probability of the harmony. Um, you have a number of thinkers who are like, like Georg Friedrich Meyer, who, as far as I can tell, is a Wolfian, but he's saying very unusual things about the demonstrability of immortality. Right, so you have, I mean, so what, what, what Leibnizian Wolfianism, what even Wolfianism is at that time is something a bit, a bit broader probably, and, and maybe more, you know, uh, liable to be caricatured. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, so I, I mean, uh, so there's, there's a, certainly Kant is, is very positively influenced by Wolf in his, in his pre-critical pre philosophy, in some cases, even defending what he regards as a Wolfian lie. Um, but I think this this changes a bit, um, and if we're focusing specifically on ontology, right, this certainly changes by the time we get to the first critique. Um, I do think that that there are there are ways in which Kant clearly still draws on Wolf. So Wolf had kind of already set the canonical division of the, the topics of metaphysics, which Kant largely abides by in the first critique, right, in terms of the you know ontology, psychology, cosmology, and theology. Um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, but I, I mean, the, the differences at that point are far more obvious. And I mean, deliberately so, because Kant is, is you know, for, for Kant, Wolf is the primary foil, um, at least of a certain way of doing philosophy. Uh, and so, you know, one of the principal differences when it comes to ontology in, in Kant and Wolf concerns, I think, the question of justification, right? And the centrality it plays in Kant's own uh, 
ontology, at least as far as if that's that that's taken to be enacted in the the transcendental analytic of the first critique, right? So Wolf does give give uh, a, a fair bit of attention to questions concerning justification of concepts and principles, right? He seeks to prove, for instance, the principle of sufficient reason, and he also thinks that that you know what's important in in framing our concepts is 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 offering a real definition of the terms that the concepts correspond to. Uh, such that their possibility is evident, right? So that's kind of Kantian language too, or at least rec language we recognize from Kant, that uh, justification involves showing the possibility of something. Um, but of course, Kant doesn't think that those kind of procedures or those kind of arguments are sufficient for, for you know, demonstrating the objective validity of, you know, of, of, of the principles and concepts of the understanding. Right, so there's a commonality there again in terms of their commitment to ontology having, you know, it, it, you know taking up the question about justification. Um, but a difference as to what the most effective way, or indeed the only effective way, of demonstrating or justifying these principles and concepts might be. Thank you for that. Um, uh, it, you you've been giving really, really um, robust answers and really going through the history and the concepts. And uh, I've actually learned a lot today, actually more than I even knew before. I only could scratch the surface of what I knew with Wolf. This is why I brought you on here. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if if we can now turn to you and focus on what are you working on currently and and maybe how did you also get a um how did you get to know Wolf and how did you start beginning with yeah. scholarship on Wolf? Yeah, so um in terms of what I'm working on now, uh I'm uh, I know I have a couple of con related projects that that I'm working on. Um one is the the new Academy edition of Kant's Anthropologie. Um, so you might know there's a new edition of the of, of the Academy edition of Kant's work that's being planned. Um, and so I, a, along with a with a, a colleague, are responsible for the the anthropology. Um, in terms of Wolf related projects, I mean a couple of essays here and there. Obviously, the book that's coming out that's that's clearly important for looking at you know the importance of Ger of Wolf's German metaphysics in the first half of the 18th century. Um, I'm also looking at, uh, with Falk Wunderlich again, doing a, a historical critical edition of Wolf's German Metaphysics, the, the, the actual German version. As I said, there's, it's a text that undergoes you know, kind of incredible development over the course of Wolf's lifetime. Twelve different editions, many of which are different from the other. Uh, and so it's a text that, I mean, we've been making do with the reprint by Olms largely until this time. Um, but it'll be useful to, to have all of the differences between editions on the page and have a, a proper scholarly edition of Wolf's work. That we can we can use, um, but in terms of how I came to Wolf, I suppose it was it was through Kant. I mean, this is often the case. You you tend to come to at least you know, in the last few years, I suppose you you tend to come to these thinkers either through Leibniz or through Kant, um, not necessarily in their own right. I I do have students now who are working directly on Wolf, but when I was a student, that was the route uh, to these figures. Um, and I yeah, I became convinced that uh, uh, that while they're I think essential for understanding Kant, they're also interesting philosophers in their own right. Uh, and uh, I think that's the case for someone like Crusius, um, that's the case for somebody like Meyer, case for somebody like Tatens, but especially for the source of them all, really, uh, it's it's important. It's, it's the case for Wolf as well. Um, and yeah, and, and so I became convinced of his own kind of, you know, intellectual interest um, and sophistication, and that just led me to work more and more on, on Wolf himself on his own, and try and understand him on his own terms, rather than how, you know, in light of how he was received by the subsequent tradition. If you were to if you were to um, if you were to approach uh, new or, or new students that were getting acquainted with with Wolf's philosophy, is there one specific text that you would point out and say, check out this text? This is a great introduction to uh -huh. Wolf's philosophy. Wolf's philosophy, or or um, is there a secondary source that you would recommend, or right. maybe an essay by yourself that that kind of highlights? a good introductory um, yeah. reading of Wolf? Well, so I, I suppose that would depend on their interest. I mean, you know, because Wolf psychology has been studied in a fair amount of detail already. Um, uh, you know, there's there's less in the way of a discussion of Wolf's, you know, uh, of his ontology or his cosmology or his theology. I mean, parts of his cosmology, like the, 
you know, the history of the you know discussions of causality in the period and how they uh, how they are reflected in systems uh, explaining the relation between the mind and the body. That's been taken up by Watkins in his book on Kant and the Metaphysics of Causality. So there's a couple of chapters there that are on the historical context, uh, and I take up Wolf and Wolfian views on these things. Um, but I, I, I mean. There's the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on Christian Wolf that I wrote with uh, Matt Hetchy. Um, that's also a good starting point just to see where you want to go from there. Um, but yeah, in terms of the German metaphysics, there isn't anything yet. But the the the, more, the forthcoming monograph would be, I think, a good place to go if you want to understand Wolf's own kind of richness as a thinker when it comes to metaphysics. Yeah, but also the impact of that of that text on the subsequent philosophical tradition in Germany. Well, I want to thank you for for being here and for taking us through um, Wolf's philosophy and his history and getting acquainted to his ideas and concepts. Um, you really, really helped um, being a part of this project that I've been trying to create. So I really want to thank you for being here today. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm, I'm sorry that we didn't get, I, I, I didn't end up showing that Wolf's an idealist, <laughs> which might be more appropriate to the theme of the, uh, uh, of the, the series, but yeah. Um... Yeah, I think uh, I think Wolf is certainly a, a very important figure to look at in the context of classical German philosophy. Actually, now that you said that, we can detour here for a second. <laughs> and how is Wolf um, an idealist, according to you? Sorry, I'm throwing stuff at you now at this point. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I don't. So, I mean, probably according to some lights, he is an idealist, right? He has certain commitments about the uh, what look like the ideality of space and time. Um, uh, his views point towards a kind of uh, Leibnizian monadology without explicitly endorsing it. So, I mean, there's there's certainly a version of Wolf where he's just an out-and-out -out idealist. Um, but I think that, I mean, Wolf's aims are a bit broader than that. He actually thought that just the distinction between idealist and materialist was quite harmful in philosophy. And what he wanted to do was to try, I mean, and maybe this is the most idealistic move of all in looking at later forms of idealism, but he tried to, to kind of establish a perspective that would look to harmonize both. Right, so where an, an idealist uh, like uh, like Leibniz or a materialist like whomever can look at Wolf's account of space in terms of a, of an order, um, and and say, well, yeah, that that broadly captures what I'm getting at. Right, so Wolf was interested. In, he was interested in kind of um, continuing party disputes. Right, he wanted philosophy to be less partisan, uh, and so his aim with uh, in a number of aspects of his ontology, for instance, is explicitly to to try and unify or, or find a perspective that unifies idealism and materialism. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, answering that last question. Um, and I don't want to take too much of your time. So thank you for being here and being a part of this project. And um, it was it was a fantastic conversation and discussion. My pleasure.